welcome to Right Medicine, a podcast that explores the minds, motivations and practices of people who create content that connects with and educates healthcare professionals. I'm your host, Alex Housen, a former nurse, a medical sociologist and an education writer and researcher in healthcare. Join me to learn from education professionals about resources and tools of the trade and listen to stories about what drives them in the medical education field. If your work involves planning, designing, or delivering education to healthcare professionals, this podcast is for you. I'm here today with Amanda Kazerski, Vice Principal of Educational Strategy at the Academy for Continued Healthcare Learning. I'm excited to talk to Amanda. We first met at the beginning of 2020, which feels like, let's say, about 100 years ago now, when we both co-presented as faculty in a preparation course for the Alliance's CHCP exam. I'm delighted to have her on the show today, which we recorded in the middle of 2020. Welcome to Right Medicine. Hello and welcome to Right Medicine. I'm here today with Amanda Kajerski. I'm delighted to have her on the show today. We're going to talk about uh, instructional design and geek out a little bit and mm-hmm. some of those instructional design parameters. So let's dive in. Can we start, first of all, just by talking about how you find your way into maybe education in general and CME in particular? Yeah, first, let me just say thank you uh, for inviting me and um, including me in this podcast. I'm delighted to have this little chat with you. I think my way into CME is a lot like a lot of uh, other folks in our industry. We just fell in it. I was in a prior position working in the occupational medicine field and just was ready for a change. And I happened to stumble across this job posting that was relatively close to my house. And I thought, oh, this sounds interesting. You're educating physicians and working with uh, pharmaceutical companies. I live on the East Coast. I'm surrounded by pharmaceutical companies. To me, I was like, oh, let's see what this is about. And I had a wonderful interview with the, the president of that company. And we hit it off right from the get-go. And basically, it just kind of was like, okay, you're, you have a, you know, a good rapport about you. You seem like you have a good head on your shoulders and this is going to be baptism by fire. So let's go. <laughs> so when I started, it was, I want to say 2008. And it was really at the time period of seeing me where things were changing and mm-hmm. where I think I was able to jump in was that I didn't have, I don't want to say the baggage, but I didn't have the experience of, my predecessors who remembered the wild, wild west where, you know, times were loose and free and you could, you know, basically have any kind of conversation you want and really just kind of put a number on a paper and Mm -hmm. that would be your, your grant. Um, So I came in already with parameters and just a, you know, a new world of seeming that basically started my foundation. And I think that that allowed me to really get into the whys, you know, why are we doing this? How come CME is working? And that is really what started my path in CME and my interest in instructional design. There's something really powerful about being on the edges of things and being able to have a different perspective about what's going on in the center mm-hmm. and, and ask those sometimes difficult questions mm-hmm. or the questions yeah. that other people haven't necessarily been invested in or or thought to ask. I'm curious, you said you're in occupational medicine. Did you have a kind of learning design role there? No, actually not at all. I was in the field. I was a field sales and regional manager type of position. My background, my schooling and clinical background is as an athletic trainer. So I did work as a athletic trainer at a division one university and then also in the high school. So clinically, I you know, have a foundation of you know, science, medicine, all of that part of it, which is really one of the reasons why I gravitated towards CME because I felt like as a healthcare provider myself, I know what it's like to have to take CE courses. You know, 
it brings a lot of perspective to me when it's my turn to go and take my course and I I know what I like and I know what I don't like. And I know when I actually want to sit down and learn and when I just want to get credit. Yeah, that's really interesting. You have that healthcare provider background, but you also have that, you know, learning and education background in terms of training. How do you see differences then? You know, sometimes people use those terms interchangeably, right? Training, learning, mentoring, educating. Do you have kind of working you know, differences in those kind of concepts in your day to day? Yes and no. Work? And I don't think I ever honestly really thought about it until you just mentioned it. You know, when I take a step back and revisit your question, I want to say, no, you know, it's not different. However, how I do it, yes, it's it's very different. You know, and I, I don't, again, realize why I would even say that, because I do think that what we do for clinicians in our CME you know, courses really is exactly the same thing that we should be doing you know, internally. And for anything that we're doing, education, learning, training wise, it is, especially for those of us who are in the adult education space, we are always learning, improving or training for a reason. So now that you've brought it to light, I don't really see a difference. <laughs> the kind of key linchpin there, I guess, is goal and intention. Mm -hmm. I think it it really does drive really what you're going to do as an individual in our workplace. What is the goal? As a clinician, what is your goal? And that is really what's going to determine the steps that you're taking, it being either a a quick sprint or a slow crawl. The athlete coming out there, right? Do you think we pay enough attention to goals and and clinicians' own goals in the education that we design and provide in CME? Unfortunately, no, I don't think so. I think we so often are just focused on getting them to the you know content, getting them to the activity that we don't always stop and think, what is the clinician looking for in this activity? What is their goal? What are their goals? And it makes me think more so now as the outcome standardization project has really been underway. And for the longest time, there's been a lot of focus on the number of CME certificates and completers and these these terms that still are very variable. But the OSP has you know new terminology that basically said, It doesn't matter if they claim credit. If they came to the activity with the intention of looking for one certain segment or one piece of information and they got it, then learning occurred. And and I think it's really potentially the cusp of us really trying to think about that more. Why are we creating the education for whom? And is it okay if we don't have them all completing the credit and earning CME? And they are just getting the content that they need. So I think historically, it definitely has been looked over. I know I, more often than not, am always trying to be that voice of, well, I think you're looking at it from, you know, too much of an ivory tower. Let's take a step back and how would a user go through this activity? What is a clinician, you know, trying to get? So that's really interesting. Have you been involved in the OSP project? I have not been. I've been following it, you know, from their first, I guess, release of that first, was it a white paper a year or so ago. And I know that they've been really talking about it quite a bit. I know a lot of the supporters, well, there's a number of supporters now that are starting to adopt the definitions. And I I think it, it helps us as providers just know what they're looking to see and what these terms mean to them. And I think the, the big piece, and I've heard it discussed at various meetings, is that it's not for us to define value of what those definitions are. So some supporters will put more value on a different definition than what I would consider you know, a valuable number. But that, that's not for me to determine. It's for me to say, you know, across the board, when I'm giving you this learner number, this is my definition and this is what's acceptable or what's been um, recognized in the industry. That's interesting. And listeners, if you're not familiar with the OSP, it's the Outcome Standardization Project, which was initiated by a group of, let's call them methodologists, outcomes methodologists in the Alliance for Continuing Education in the Health Professions. And I'll make sure to put a link in the show notes to some information about that project. So I guess talking about outcomes takes us to design Mm -hmm. and 
the whole notion of educational design. What are you thinking about or what's your starting place when you are thinking about educational design and strategy? I'm always thinking about what are we trying to accomplish, who the audience is, and how are we going to design a program? So some of the first thoughts I have are, well, is it going to be live or is it going to be a web-based program? 2020 <laughs> seems to be the year that you know, has, has put a wrench in a lot of things and all of us have gravitated and just by force really to, to go into the web-based space, mm-hmm. which I think allows for a lot more creativity in some ways for instructional design. But I do think that live too, you know, when, when we're trying to determine what are we going to create, it's for me, is it going to be live or web-based program? And then I you know, take a step back and try to figure out what are the gaps what are the clinicians doing? Really look at the, the big picture of the needs and determining how are we going to change this? Is it a knowledge change? Do they just need you know that knowledge type of approach or is it much more robust and we need to get into that clinical and physical practice change? So a couple of things come to mind there. One is about differences between designing for knowledge versus designing for skill or competence and the other is and listeners we are recording this in September 2020 so we've had six or seven months of mostly working from home if you're in the education field and a lot of live meetings moved online so my question there is are you seeing online fatigue in your learners, given that, you know, the, the whole field is is pretty much locked into an online approach just now? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's definitely more anecdotal. I don't have any solid evidence. And I think I've been talking to colleagues and what we have seen, at least what I have seen, is that from, let's say, April through July, everything was just, you know, let's just push it out. We just got to push it virtual. And some groups really did a wonderful job of transitioning a live in-person, you know, annual meeting into a virtual event. And then there's others that really still need to try to figure out what are the best ways to do it. But at the end of the day, it's really going to ask a lot for a clinician to sit in front of a computer for eight hours, if that's your intention of delivering a virtual conference. So I think instructional design took on a whole new approach when push came to shove this year and groups had to figure out how are we going to deliver this education that was delivered and or originally intended to be a live two-day event and now we're going to push it out as a live web-based activity. I think that there's a lot of considerations outside of that still when it comes to online education and creating activities, but where we are clinicians in general are working still. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they they okay. still had to go to, you know, to their jobs. So then you have to try to figure out what are we doing with the, the activity and how can we still have it meet their needs mm-hmm. in their very busy schedule? And it comes back to that question that has, has always been present, at least as long as I've been in the field of how are we going to reach the clinicians? You can create this wonderful activity, but if no one's coming because the schedule isn't conducive to theirs or after work, now they have to manage their kids who are virtual learning. And there really was a, what I noticed, a really small window of trying to push out a a live web-based program. And I think what we've seen and I've heard talked about more is that some of the tried and true classic print or text-based activities that someone can print out or at least access on their own without having to sign in and follow a a live virtual stream seems to be getting a little bit more traction again because it puts the onus back on the clinician to work when it's conducive to them. Yeah, that makes sense, actually. I haven't heard anybody talking about that, but thinking about it in terms of people being Zoomed out, you know, online programs are not necessarily always at convenient times for clinicians. So being able to have that, you know, something in your hand that is tangible and that mm-hmm. you can, or your device yeah. that you can kind of pull out when you need to completely makes sense. And so what are some of the things that you're doing and thinking about 
in trying to breach that that Zoom fatigue. Because the other part of that is, and you kind of alluded to it, is it's always hard in instructional design to get somebody's attention. Jonathan Haidt talks about this in his book, The Happiness Hypothesis, where he describes the brain as a rider and an elephant. And on the one hand, you have the rider that is the kind of rational decision-making part of the brain. And on the other hand, you have the elephant, which is our emotions and our gut feelings and all the other attracted to shiny objects, parts of who we are. So how are you thinking about that and approaching that in this really interesting uh, set of limitations that we have right now? Yeah, yeah, no, I think I love that analogy. I think it's such a great question because when I when I look at the online activities and I was just you know talking about the live annual meetings and live virtual conferences that you know have taken one path for online learning online learning can go so many different directions. And I think I have always gravitated towards online courses and creating them just because of the flexibility and the ability to offer them on demand so that they're available for a clinician, Mm -hmm. regardless of if it's a, you know, a live webinar or a virtual conference. So I think that the instructional design is essential for online programming because a clinician can start an activity and very quickly if they're not engaged or seeing something that's meaningful or relevant to them, they can close the window and very easily find another program if they're looking for CME. So I do think that shiny object you know, syndrome mm-hmm. is something that you kind of have to play with in CME, but make it meaningful. So I've always been a huge fan of the ability to create a, a course that's going to be relatable in some manner to the clinician. And does that mean, is it you know, just using some really powerful cases or is it using different means of engaging them, getting a faculty who is a little bit more uh, experienced or has the capacity to use more of a storytelling approach right. that's going to you know have them come in if it, if it is more of a didactic lecture or didactic type program. Mm-hmm. I think that with technology, the the world is really at our fingertips. So a lot of the discussion over the past few years have has focused on personalized learning. And I think you know we hear personalized learning quite a bit, but what does that really mean? Is it just a, a question and answer type of progression where they're getting content that's you know personalized mm-hmm. or is it really adaptive learning? Are we able to offer more adaptive learning? So these are terms that we within the industry use, and I don't know if clinicians really would react to us saying, oh, an adaptive learning platform, but I think it's using some more of those creative elements in your design and in your marketing that's going to draw them in. And that's kind of slightly disheartening because you don't want to put so much effort into you know, elements that at the end of the day aren't going to impact the practice or isn't going to improve one's knowledge, but you have to get them to your activity. So mm-hmm. yeah, th- there's different pieces to the whole spectrum of learning. And that first piece of pulling them in, you need the bells and the whistles and you need some of that shiny objects. But once they're in the program, I do think it's really important that we go back to those foundational elements that you know, have been shown to be effective for improving knowledge. You have to have interactivity. Is it gaming? Is it polling questions? Allow feedback. Is it that live feedback from the presenter? Right. Or is it a pre-recorded, you know, some sort of communication back to them? Because there, there's been a, enough literature out there that we know what you know has been shown to be effective. And it's about time that we start applying those principles into the the work that we do. And that's what I love. I love just looking into literature, seeing what's been shown to work and figuring out how can we do that in our program and what is going to be overkill and what Mm -hmm. is going to be just enough. Right. Yeah. Closing that loop through feedback and reflection is so important. And you've, you've talked about instructional design a couple of times now. Do you think that we're seeing more explicit instructional design in medical education and education for health care professionals in general than perhaps 
even five or six years ago. You've been in the field since 2008. Can you talk a little bit about some of the changes you're seeing in, in how people approach education design? Yeah, I think for sure. I definitely say within the past few years, I've seen it tremendously, without a doubt, in the work we're creating. But then also when I'm looking at other programs out there, I'm seeing it. And then for my own personal continuing education, which is, to me, I always thought they were just on the back burner, you know, the courses that I, I was taking. And I actually sat through a course for my own personal, not even CME professional development, but my own athletic training development this is wonderful. They're, they're doing what we've been trying to do, you know, in for physicians. So now right. it's definitely applying across the healthcare and the education field. I think for a while, that was still the, the tried and true, a pre-test and a post-test. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how you're going to so measure, cool. mm -hmm. you know, that's how you're going to measure change. And you're going to have a, a didactic lecture that that's how it works. That's how clinicians have been trained. And that's what clinicians want to see. And some clinicians still do. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think we know that there, there's different ways to get that done. So it's been a slow transition. Even live symposia have figured out ways to have mm -hmm. it be more than just a didactic lecture. And again, like you said, I've been in this field for, for 12 years and I've seen it. I'm excited to see where it's going to continue to go. And again, I keep coming back to technology, but I think technology is playing a huge role in that. Right. Uh, I've seen it more in even the live symposia sessions where now they're weaving technology in. Is it, you know, different ways to make it engaging with the 3D animations and mm -hmm. graphics, you know, through presentations? Or is it the ability to incorporate some of the iPad technology and have the learners access information and, you know, studies on their phone and follow along mm -hmm. on their own personal devices? So it's ways like that that once turned to, huge symposium into just a one-way lecture to now an opportunity for the audience to, to be engaged again. And it all comes back to engaging that clinician to drive them through the program and help them get at least, you know, one clinical pearl out of the, out of the content. Oh, it's so interesting what you say about technology because it's kind of shifted from, it's not just this adjunct to learning and education. You know, our whole lives are integrated with and woven through and around technology. You know, we're kind of connected in all sorts of different ways. So it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. And also, you know, you're kind of making the point that you're doing training in your, in your athletic field. I think, well, here's a question, you know, to what extent do you think continuing medical education is going to be cross fertilizing much more with the kind of online trainings that we are seeing exploding in just about every field at the moment? Yeah, I, I think it's going to continue. And I think that we've been charged or maybe we've been a little slow at looking at what other industries are doing. Uh -huh. you know, yeah. And I, I think we're slowly adopting it ourselves. So I do think that training, you know, like you're referring to it, has been done for years in other uh, industries. And mm -hmm. just now medical education is starting to adopt you know, some of these approaches or technology. So I do think that it's going to continue to evolve. I think that what we're doing here is going to continue to trickle down. I think even looking at the primary and you know, secondary schools and what are they doing in, especially with virtual learning, yeah. how is it working for them? <laughs> and what can we do for adult learning that is leveraging some of those approaches? Right now, the virtual world and our social distancing has still left a hunger for small groups. Yes. So it seems like small group learning is going to come back in, in different styles. And instead of just doing small group virtual, that concept of pods, you know, it seems like it's more and more tangible. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. Where you, you find a pod of clinicians that you can get together and push out you know, education in small groups like that. I do think that elements from elementary school, you know, through adult learning in other fields is something that is all connected and there's a page that we can definitely take from each of them. Absolutely. Maybe a good place to kind of wrap up our conversation is around, I like the way that you kind of envision learning as a, as a continuum. And of course, 
you know, when you read things around continuing medical education, there's reference to that continuum, but I'm not sure if it's something that we kind of live on a daily basis in the, in the field. But let me ask, what's the best learning experience you've had in recent times? Oh, goodness. That's good. You're going to put me on the spot for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, and I don't even want to simplify it as much as it was simplified, but the best learning experience was this corporate training that we had to do for you know, just sexual harassment training. Mm-hmm. And it was a course that wasn't ours. It was you know, developed by corporate and their whole approach. I was so annoyed. Oh, I was, I just wanted to like sexual harassment. I know, I know. I just wanted to skip, skip, skip and go fast. And I couldn't, yeah. I had to sit through and right. go through it all. But the way they created the program was exactly like it should have been. There was a little bit of lecture. There was a little bit of audio. And they stopped. They asked a couple of questions. They did some more education. They created questions in different formats. They created a little gaming piece to it. Like It was just everything that we've talked about that I always you know, tried to say, this is what we need to do. And it was done. <laughs> They did oh, that's it. That's so interesting. And I was so frustrated because I just wanted to be able to skip through and say, yes, I did my training and you know, move on. Yeah. And I, I couldn't just skip. I had to go through it. And it really, you know, they, it did a, a great job of getting the message across and doing the, the various testing places for you know, polling and when to learn and when to do an assessment. It was very well done. And to me, I'm like, this was just a really straightforward type of activity but the methodology and the instructional design that they applied was there. And that was, you know, just within the past six weeks. There was resistance, but they eased you into it. And it, it's just a really great reminder that often what's in the way is the way. Yes. Yep. Completely. Amanda, thank you so much for taking time to talk with me today and uh, share some of your perspective and your experience in instructional design and and what learning means to you in your professional life. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks for including me. I feel like I, you know, could talk about this for hours because I do, I love what we do. And I appreciate the opportunity. Like so many people in the world of continuing education in the health professions, Amanda fell into this field. There's something really powerful about being on the edges of things and being able to have a different perspective about what's going on in the centre and to ask those sometimes difficult questions or the questions that other people haven't necessarily been invested in or even thought to ask. And in this way, people like Amanda are able to make their stamp. And part of the stamp that Amanda has made is to really dial into clinician goals as a key component of the education that we design and provide in CME CPD. As she noted, the Outcomes Standardization Project puts these goals front and center and reinforces the question of what it is we're trying to accomplish in CME and CPD. Who are the audiences? And how are we going to design programs that really support learning? This question is especially pertinent now that the entire field of education from K-12 through to professional development has pretty much shifted online. And Zoom fatigue has become, for many, very entrenched. There are some interesting studies that are beginning to pop up in the literature about Zoom fatigue that I've included in the show notes. The pandemic has really focused this field's concentration on how to design education that is relatable, relevant and meaningful for clinicians. Amanda provides plenty of food for thought in this episode about getting the attention of the part of the brain that's attracted to shiny objects and reminds us that often what's in the way is the way. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Alex Housen, and this is Right Medicine. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing or leaving a review on your podcast listening platform. This helps other listeners to find us.